I found the following article in a November 1968 magazine, and I loved it because it brought back a lot of memories of my own childhood. Um, the days of the outdoor uh, toilet, the little house out back were, were over by the time I was a kid, but I remember going on vacations up north of Pop's Cottage, which I've you know, told you about in various other videos, um, using an outdoor toilet and chamber pots. And I reflect on those fondly, believe it or not. Well, this article called Things I Remember uh, concerns the uh, little house out back of long ago. So I'd like to share that article with you. Among the pleasant memories of all of us for whom childhood dates back to long ago, there were many things and many words not used today. The boot scraper, the churn dasher, and even the old butter churn itself, the heavy ice tongs, the neck yoke, the mold board, not even contained in the abridged dictionaries used in schools today. These and many other words and that and the wonderful things they stand for are among our fond memories of the good old days. Today, modern people speak without shame of indoor toilets and bathrooms and listen with surprise when they hear grandpa refer to the outhouse, the word meaning one goes outdoors to get there. Uh, the back house, meaning back of the family house or back of the woodshed, and more refined, the little house, smaller than the family residence. I have old photographs that show a typical outdoor toilet in the early 1900s. It was taken near my child; they were taken near my childhood home at Port Sanilac, Michigan. Back then, the class or social status of a family could usually be measured better by the type of construction and state of, of upkeep of this building than by the family residence itself. The adults never talked about the little house. Excuse me, we didn't use the word adults back then either. They were grown-ups or old folks, but never adults. But we, their children, talked about the little houses without hesitation. They were a part of our regular conversation from time to time, as casual to us as our leggings or overshoes or sunbonnets. <laughs> Remember them? Social status or class back then could also be measured by the tiny decorative openings sometimes sawed into the little house door. These were quarter moons, seldom more than six inches high and two inches wide, shaped like this, and with the uh, back of the moon always to the left. They were cut near the top of the door. Only the families who cared, who wanted to be nice, upper class, so to speak, bothered to cut these openings. Strangely enough, and I do not know why, we always called them half moons instead of a quarter moon. Once in a while, but less often, a round star was sawed through the door near the moon, giving two small openings. The child, the children, <coughs> excuse me, the children <coughs> around my childhood home in Port Sanilac did not write nasty remarks or anything else on their own little house walls. They wrote some things and drew some pictures on the country school little house walls. But the children and perhaps some adult passengers re really marked up the little houses uh, or house walls at the Pier Marquette Railroad Station at nearby Carsonville and Applegate. There were many things written here, most of them vulgar, but some of them real gems of poetry. The great folk poet Carl Sandburg collected folk poetry from all over the United States, and in the summer of 1914 or 1915, he visited Port Sanilac just to talk to people and to collect old sailor songs and other stories. He visited the depot, um, Little Houses, at Carsonville and Applegate, and copied many of the local lyrics in his notebook. Of course, he never could publish them, but he told about them as his experiences collecting them around Port Sanilac in a lecture he gave at the Michigan State Normal College in Ypsilanti in the winter of 1922. There were two newspapers circulated at Port Sanilac, the Port Huron Times Herald and the Sanilac County Republican. It was a common saying among the farmers there, uh, that you could tell a good farmer from a poor one by the length of time he spent in the little house reading these papers. The lazy farmer always loafed and read the paper before he came out. On Halloween night, the farm boys each year did at least two things to celebrate. They went around the country tipping over outhouses, and they stole watermelons from their neighbors' gardens. On certain farms, the good farm wife always handed out popcorn or homemade maple sugar candy to the roving bands of kids. These farmers never had their outhouses tipped over or their melon patches destroyed, as some others did. The business section of the village of Port Sanilac consisted of several buildings. There was Chris Oldfield's Grocery, John Thompson's Grocery, Rudolph Platt's Drugstore, 
Alf Walker's Barber Shop, Jim Mugen's Bank, John Falls Blacksmith Shop, and Fred Ray or Fred Raymond's Hardware Store. Later, uh, Mugen's Bank went broke, and another bank now stands in the area of the old barber shop. Two other families run grocery stores in the old field and are in the old field and Thompson buildings, and descendants of Rudolph Platts still run Platts Drugstore, while the Raymond descendants still run the hardware. A restaurant has replaced the blacksmith shop, and the town has grown and changed. There are a couple of other restaurants and a garage. The drugstore no longer sells gasoline. Walker's Barber Shop <clears throat> was one room building with a flat roof. On Halloween, when the boys were tipping over outhouses, they always carried two downtown. One they set up in the middle of the street on the four corners. Uh, Port Sanilac had two main streets, one running east and west, the other running north and south, their intersection, of course, and was called the Four Corners. The other uh, outhouse, w which the boys kidnapped, was always lifted to the flat roof of Elf Walker's Barbershop and set uh, up straight on the roof, its door facing the street. <laughs> Another Halloween trick was to borrow some farmer's four-wheeled one-horse buggy, bring it downtown, and place it on the roof, uh, straddling the peak of the congregational church, with the front of the buggy and the horse's shafts facing the street. This was about two blocks west of Walker's Barbershop, and was the only other building in Port Sanilac to be decorated on Halloween night. In the village and countryside, all of us were poor, at least in terms of money, as compared with present-day standards. That is, everyone was poor except one family. This was the Cunningham family, who had made a fortune in the city. They bought a farm and built big buildings on it, and hired uh, a family, a farm family to live there and do scientific and experimental farming. We neighboring farmers, without exception, all made fun of them and continued to farm in our own old-fashioned way, except that from time to time we borrowed some of what was then was then very modern machinery, like fanning mills and cutting boxes, to lighten our own workload. The city uh, family also bought some land in the village and built themselves a large and very expensive house, um, which they came to live in for a few weeks during the summer. Behind the residence, they built not one, but two outhouses. No, they were not one for men and one for women. They were one for their own family <clears throat> and the other for the housekeeper and the other family servants who also lived in a separate part of the beautiful summer residence. In Atrium County, Michigan, farther north in Port Sanilac, where I lived during the 1920s, there still remained in the woods just outside the village of Bel Air an old deserted Indian settlement. The wooden houses consisted of two rooms, one about 20 feet by 30 feet, and a lean-to shanty about four feet by eight feet attached to the back of the big room. On the big room, there was a front doorway with a door hung by leather strap hinges. There was an outside doorway, but never a door on the lean-to. This back room was the family outhouse. It gave real privacy because the Indian had to go outdoors and around behind the house, out of sight, to get there. Uh, there a pit had been dug, and uh, for a seat, a tree branch had been fastened about one and a half feet from the ground. I returned to Bel Air a few years ago, remember this was in 1968, to visit old friends and to take pictures of the old Indian houses. Like most of us, when we go back to the old home, I was too late. The woods had been cut down, the houses were gone, no one of the younger generation even remembered them or seemed interested when I tried to talk about them. Here, at, uh, here also at Bel Air, Judge Bailey, now gone these many years, had presented me with some interesting material. In his younger days, he had been a personal friend of James Whitcomb Riley in Indiana. Riley had given him a collection of poems <clears throat> which he had never been had published. Some of their, them were even better than his published poetry, but because of their country nature, Riley was ashamed to have them published. One, however, has been somewhat widely circulated. A friend of James Whitcomb Riley, a local newspaper editor, privately printed some of them and handed them out among his friends. It was one of these copies which Riley had given to Judge Bailey and that the judge uh, allowed me to borrow, and from it I have copied the following poem, Passing of the Back House. When memory keeps me company and moves to smiles or tears, a weather-beaten object looms through the mist of years. Behind the house and barn that stood a half a mile or more, in hurrying feet a path had made straight to its swinging door. Its architecture was a type of simple classic art, but in the tragedy of life it played a leading part. And off the passing traveler drove slow and heaved a sigh to see the modest hired girl slip out with glances shy. 
We had our posy garden that the women loved so well. I loved it too, but better still, I loved the stronger smell that filled the evening breezes so full of homely cheer and told the night or taken tramp that human life was near. On lazy August afternoons it made a little bower, delightful where my grandfather sat and whiled away an hour, for there the summer morning its very cares entwined at berry bushes reddened in the steaming soil behind. All day fat spiders spun their webs to catch the buzzing flies. They flitted to and from the house where Ma was baking pies. And once a swarm of hornets had built a palace there and stung my unsuspecting aunt, I might not tell you where. Then father took a flaming pole that was a happy day. He nearly burned the building up, but the hornets left to stay. When summer blooms began to fade and winter to carouse, we banked the little building with a heap of hemlock boughs. But when the crust was on the snow and the sullen skies were gray, in sooth the building was no place where one could wish to stay. We did our duties promptly, there one purpose swayed the mind. We tarried not nor lingered on what we left behind. The torture of that icy seat could make a Spartan sob, for needs must scrape the goose flesh with a lacerating cob that from a frost-encrusted nail was suspended by a string, my father was a frugal man and wasted not a thing. When Grandpa had to go out back and make a morning call, we'd bundle up the dear old man with a muffler and a shawl. I knew the hole on which he sat was padded all around, and once I dared to sit there, t'was all too wide, I found. My loins were all too little, and I jackknifed there to stay. They had to come and get me out, or I would have passed away. Then father said ambition was a thing that boys should shun, and I must and I must use the children's hole till childhood days were done. But I still marvel at the craft that cut those holes so true, the baby hole, the slender hole, the fitted that fitted Sister Sue. That dear old country landmark I've tramped round a bit, and in the lap of luxury my lot has been to sit. But ere I die I'll eat the fruit of trees I robbed of yore, then seek the shanty where my name is carved upon the door. I know the old familiar smell will soon my faded will soothe my faded soul. I now a man, but nonetheless I'll try <laughs> the children's hole. Well, I hope that you enjoyed this uh, nostalgic look back um, to a time long gone that will probably never return. Uh, thanks for listening and stopping by. Like and subscribe, and uh, God bless. Have a great evening.